It's now a real honor to present uh, Andrew Abella uh, to all of you. Um, Andrew is uh, uh, currently the dean of the Tim and Steph Bush School of Business at the Catholic University of America. Um, he formerly, for the last four years, was provost of the university, overseeing all of the academic uh, programs as well as the, uh, the press and uh, other academic uh, uh, organizations on campus, and has returned to his first love, which of course is the business world, and especially uh, the business school um, at um, uh, Bush Business School at the Catholic University of America. Uh, prior to coming to the Bush School, um, uh, Dr. Abella was uh, a, a, man a marketing consultant for McKinsey and uh, then later a brand uh, a manager for Procter & Gamble uh, in the uh, industrial world. And um, uh, he has written a, a very important book, I think, uh, for all of us uh, who are out here uh, thinking about the Catholic social teaching and business ethics. It's called uh, A Catechism for Business. And it has won a Novak Award. And truly, I have used it myself. Uh, it is a really excellent, uh, excellent book. Uh, Dr. Abella is going to be talking to us today about the socialist delusion and the Catholic business solution. So Dr. Abella. It's only at the Napa Institute that you have four bishops as a warm-up act, you know? So <laughs> it's very, very humbling. So why are, why are young people so attracted to socialism, and what should we do about it? Is socialism even something that we should be worrying about? Because some people don't seem to think so. Here's a recent article from the New York Times, an op-ed saying, can we please relax about socialism? The author claims to be a proud son of the European Christian socialist tradition, which includes apparently, for example, Pope Pius XI's encyclical Quadragesimo Anno. The author points to something in Quadragesimo Anno that he likes, but somehow he seems to have missed this famous line about the proud Christian socialist tradition in Quadragesimo Anno, which goes, religious socialism and Christian socialism, these are contradictory terms. No one can be at the same time a good Catholic and a true socialist. I know, I know that you are shocked that the New York Times got this wrong. <laughs> but should we, should we relax about socialism? Might as well say, Let's just relax about poverty, because nowhere in the world has socialism led to prosperity, only to economic decline. Here's a picture of a woman looking for food for her kids in a Venezuelan grocery store, just to reinforce that. Or how about, how about this one? Can we please relax about genocide? Why genocide? Because genocide has also been a typical consequence of socialism. In fact, the death toll from socialist experiments is simply enormous. The late professor Rudolf Rommel uh, of the University of Hawaii dedicated his career to studying what he called democide. Democide is a form of genocide. It is the murder of citizens by their own government. According to Dr. Rommel, democide arises because, quote, the more power a government has, the more it can act arbitrarily according to the whims and desires of the state of the elite, and the more it will make war on others and murder its foreign and domestic subjects. And according to Rommel, the greatest amount of democide has been in socialist regimes. Here are some of the larger ones. Cuba, 73,000 deaths. Angola, 125,000. Ethiopia, 725,000. North Korea, 1.6 million and counting. Cambodia, 2 million. China, 35 million, Soviet Union, 61.9 million subjects murdered by their own governments. In all, Rommel identifies 29 socialist countries who have murdered significant numbers of their own citizens. The point I want to make is these are not coincidences. Socialism, even in its mildest form, 
invariably leads to negative consequences. Why? Because socialism is an ideology that can only end up in government control of most or all of the property. Because socialism sets up this utopian expectation that it will take care of everything, your health care, your education, your home, your work, and so on. But no government is ever rich enough to take care of every citizen's every need. And so the socialist state is always trying to expand, always taking over more and more property. As Margaret Thatcher famously said, the problem with socialists is they always run out of other people's money, right? So they're always looking for more. And this leads to totalitarianism. Why? When you take away control of property, you take away liberty, and it's that simple. We are physical beings. We have physical needs for food, clothing, shelter, transportation. If we don't control our own property, then we are dependent on others to take care of us. Socialism is an example of Eric Vogelin's phrase, popularized by the great William F. Buckley, of imminentizing the eschaton. So the, the eschaton, right, the, 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 the new heaven and new earth at the end of time, imminentizing is trying to bring it in the here and now. Uh, and the problem with this is explained very, very well by Pope St. John Paul II, who wrote, when people think that they possess the secret of a perfect social organization, which makes evil impossible, they also think they can use any means, including violence and deceit, in order to bring that organization into being. And so you end up murdering large numbers of your own citizens because you think they're getting in the way of your great project. So given this, why is socialism so attractive to our young people? I think it's because of the negative impression they have of capitalism, which they get, at least in part from the media, particularly the entertainment media. The Media Research Center did a study of Academy Award-winning movies, which showed that 79% of the CEOs portrayed in these movies were portrayed as criminals. In reality, fewer than 1% of CEOs are removed because of criminal or unethical behavior. Here's an evil character from the Lego movies. This is President Business, I kid you not. He's the evil CEO who tries to take over the world. I'll bet your children and grandchildren have a little figure among their Legos of President Business, the evil CEO. No wonder young people have a negative impression of business, if this is what they're seeing from a very young age. But a bigger part of the problem, I think, is that there are aspects of capitalism that are actually not good, right? that are not consistent with our Catholic faith. And I'm not talking about business people who break the law. I'm talking about legal but immoral business practices. Now, this is the point in my talk where some of you might get a little uncomfortable because I'm criticizing capitalism, but I, I beg you to hear me out. It'll all make sense. Think of things like routinely hiring employees for 19 hours a week to avoid paying for health care, or promoting consumerism, so selling products by trying to conv convince consumers that they should look to material things to find their happiness. As an example, some years ago, I worked for a major consumer packaged goods firm, and the advertising uh, strategy for one of our sh shampoos was to convince women that they are their hair. <laughs> Do you really think that our Lord rejoices every time we convince a woman that she is her hair and no less, right? True, there are much worse things you could do, but is this the way to practice Christianity in the marketplace? Or another example, selling addictive products or services in ways that take advantage of addiction instead of trying to ameliorate it. Notice, in most of these cases, it's not a question of what you do, but how you do it. So, for example, it's not immoral to be in the gaming business, to run a casino, for example. In fact, the Catholicism of the Catholic Church says games of chance um, and wagers are not in themselves contrary to justice. They're not immoral. They do become morally acceptable when they deprive someone of what is necessary to provide for his needs and those of others. So you could see how it's going to be immoral if your whole business model depends upon and promotes addiction to gambling, for example. And then we have the case of crony capitalism, right? Using government influence to get an unfair advantage, handouts, bailouts, preferential regulation. All of these things happen today and they turn people off from capitalism. Okay, you might say they're always sleazy people, right? Capitalism isn't perfect, but it's better than any other system. Surely on balance, the positives outweigh the negatives. 
So listen to this. This is the most important thing I have to tell you this morning. We should not try to argue that the negatives of capitalism are outweighed by its positives. This is the wrong question and the wrong strategy. Why is whether the positives of capitalism outweigh the negatives the wrong question? The problem is in part with the word capitalism itself. It is our opponent's terminology. Who invented the word capitalism? This guy, Karl Marx. Now, if you're wondering, how did I get a color photo of Karl Marx? That's actually not him. That's the waxworks of him in Madame Tussauds. Anyway, <laughs> why, why would we want to use our opponent's terminology? Is anyone here from Students for Life? Anybody? Kristen, are you here? So it's a great organization, very successful, right? How successful do you think they would be if you called yourselves Students Against Choice, right? Not a very good idea. It, that's using your opponent's terminology. Why would we do that? The other problem with capitalism is the ism part. An ism is an ideology that is imposed upon reality. Capitalism, the economic system of private property ownership and the liberty to trade, is not an ism. It is the natural order of things. It is the way every society organizes itself throughout history unless someone comes along and imposes an ideology on it. So for these reasons, I would rather use the word market economy instead of capitalism. The popes seem to agree. St. John Paul II himself said market economy would be a better phrase than, than the word capitalism. Both Pope Benedict in Caritas in Veritate and Pope Francis in Evangelii Gaudium never used the word capitalism, not, not even once. But I do think, I do admit it's a losing battle and that the word capitalism is here to stay, so I am going to try to work with it. The bigger problem, I think, is that the word capitalism is so ambiguous. It covers a whole bunch of activity, both good and bad. I think it would be helpful to, to distinguish between two types of, two fundamentally different types of activity both of which we call capitalism, but which are very different from each other. And you'll see that the good outcomes, productivity, prosperity, economic justice, come from one type, and the bad outcomes, consumerism, concentration of wealth, cronyism, come from the other. So what are these two types? Think of it this way. Every business does two things. It creates value and it captures value. Right? You create value, you create something worthwhile, something that people are willing to pay for, they find valuable, and then you capture value, that is you, take, you make a profit. Every business has to do both of these things. To explain that, I'll do a little two by two matrix. Uh, if you create value, but you don't capture any of the value, what are you? You're a not-for-profit or a charity, right? So, so in our two by two matrix, you create value, yes, right? Capture value, no, so you're, you're a charity. If you capture value, but you don't create any, what are you? You're a thief, right? You didn't create any value, but you took value. <laughs> if you don't create any value or you don't capture any value, you're an inanimate object, right? You're not doing anything at all, so, so, and that's fine. Um, but if you create value and you capture value, then you are a business. So you have to do both of those to be a business. But one of these will always be your primary focus. And here's where the two kinds of capitalism come in. Your primary focus will determine what kind of capitalism you are practicing, good or bad. If your primary focus is on creating value, that is good capitalism, right? We can call that entrepreneurial capitalism. Entrepreneurial capitalists create value, they create wealth through serving others. They do what's called principled entrepreneurship, right? They produce goods that are truly good, and services that truly serve. On the other hand, if your primary focus is on capturing value, on making money regardless of what good you're doing for others, that's bad capitalism. And that's what leads to all the negative outcomes. This is what I'd like to call imperialistic capitalism. If you're capturing more than you're contributing, you're an imperialistic capitalist. Imperialistic capitalism is all about the will to power. It is a, about imposing our will on others. It is about using others for our own gain rather than serving them. Imperialistic capitalism includes all forms of crony capitalism. 
It also includes co corporations using their influence to push, for example, their own ideology on states against the will of the electorate, like we had recently with Netflix and Disney in Georgia on the, on the abortion law. And it includes any attempt to extract more wealth than you create. Wait just a minute, you say. Isn't the pursuit of wealth the very heart of capitalism? Isn't the profit motive what drives our economy? This is a very simplistic view, and it is wrong. It is a view that is usually put forward by people who have never worked a day themselves in the business world, like professors, think tank scholars, and journalists. But Dr. Abella, you're a professor, right? Yes, I am a professor, but as uh, father mentioned before starting my academic career. I spent many years in business even as a professor I run a small business on the side. I consult with businesses as do many of my colleagues in the Bush school Look the profit motive is a very simplistic and deeply inadequate way of describing what real entrepreneurs do The answer is more complicated and gives a much richer and truer account of commercial activity once again St. John Paul II said it best he said the purpose of a business firm is not simply to make a profit, but it is to be found in its very existence as a community of persons who in various ways are endeavoring to satisfy their basic needs and who form a particular group at the service of the whole society. So we go into business for four different, but each valid reasons, to make a profit, otherwise we're a charity, right, not a business, to work together in community, to earn our daily living and to serve others. All of these are part of why we go into business, and all are valuable, indeed necessary. As dean of the Bush School of Business, I have the privilege of meeting and working with many Catholic business leaders and entrepreneurs, and I think they would all agree with me on this. Some of them are in the room here today, so Tim and Steph Bush, of course, whom our school is named after, Art and Carlise Sioka. We did a case study on their company, The Wine Group. We have the, Car the Art and Carlise Sioka Center for Principal Entrepreneurship in our school. Also, La um, also uh, Larry Blanford, Sean Filer, Frank Hanna, many others. We know their business philosophies, and I think they would all agree with me. You don't go into business just for the money. You do it because you want to do some good. You want to bring a new product into the world. You want to employ people. You want to use your God-given talents through business. And you make a profit. It all fits together. This is how you imitate Christ in the marketplace, by going into business to serve others. And so this idea of the two different kinds of capitalism squares very well with Catholic teaching on business. For example, St. John Paul II, in his encyclical letter, Centesimus Annus, asks whether capitalism is the system that the newly freed economies of 1989, after 1989, should pursue. And he answers, if by capitalism is meant an economic system which recognizes the fundamental and positive role of business, the market, private property, and the resulting responsibility for the means of production, as well as free human creativity in the economic order, then the answer is certainly in the affirmative, i.e. yes. And so this is entrepreneurial capitalism. But then he goes on to say, but if by capitalism you mean a system in which freedom in the economic se sector is not circumscribed within a strong juridical framework, which places it at the service of human freedom in its totality, the core of which is religious, ethical and religious, then the, the reply is certainly negative. No, and that would be imperialistic capitalism. Pope Francis wrote, business is a noble vocation, provided that those engaged in it see themselves challenged by a greater meaning in life, to serve the common good by striving to increase the goods of the world and to make them accessible to all. That would be entrepreneurial capitalism. And when he criticizes an economy of exclusion and equality, as you've heard, or an economy that kills, he's talking about imperialistic capitalism. Do you see how helpful it would be if more people understood that there are two fundamentally different types of approach to the market economy, that we call them both capitalism, but they are so very different from each other. Do you see how this would help? It allows us to advocate for entrepreneurial ca capitalism as an approach that leads to prosperity, economic justice, and care for others without having to defend the things that people criticize capitalism for, and the bad effects that, of, of capitalism that people complain about. We don't have to say, on balance, we're better off. There's no balancing here. We can be all in for entrepreneurial capitalism, nothing to be ashamed of, no apologies. Right? This is how we can save the market economy from socialism. But it, thank you. 
but it's actually even more important than saving the market economy, as important as that is. Understanding the difference between entrepreneurial capitalism and imperialistic capitalism is important for saving our very civilization. I don't think I am exaggerating. Our civilization depends on, at root, a number of non-market institutions. So our churches, our schools, right? governmental institutions that support the rule of law, and most importantly, the family. This is the icon of the family that I could find on PowerPoint. I don't really like it. I made one of my own. It looks like this. Isn't that better? Yeah. <laughs> so. so maybe even better, this is a photograph to reinforce that. So this is. So this picture stands for family, so my own, and education, because it's my daughter's graduation from Catholic U a couple of months ago, and church, because we're standing at the shrine, the Basilica of the Immaculate Conception. So, so entrepreneurial capitalism is supportive of these non-market institutions, while imperialistic capitalism is corrosive of them. Entrepreneurial capitalism, because it's ordered to serving others, supports and reinforces virtue. It rewards courage, discipline, and creativity. Imperialistic cap capitalism weakens these virtues because it rewards greed and selfishness. It's important to note, though, that even though entrepreneurial capitalism supports non-market institutions, it is still vitally dependent upon them. It cannot create them. It can reward and reinforce a virtuous man, but it cannot take a child and form him into a virtuous adult. Only non-market institutions, churches, schools, and especially the family can do that. If you want a really good explanation of why this is so, see the article by Tim Reichert and Fran Meyer uh, from First Things last year called Origami of the Soul. The essence of the argument is that proper human formation, they draw an analogy to, to folding, hence the, the name origami, requires hierarchy, the kind of hierarchy you find in the family, the school, and the church, but not in the marketplace. Imperial capitalism, on the other hand, we will, will kill our civilization. Uh, let me tell you why. Technology has always been an enabler of greater efficiencies. Digital technology is taking that much further. Professor Roger Martin is a former dean of the business school at the University of Toronto. In a Harvard Business Review article earlier this year, he made the important point that digital technology is allowing companies to become super efficient, which leads to markets being dominated by few and very large and very powerful companies. He worries that this concentration will lead to market instability and social disorder. I agree with that. There's something very democratic about having lots of companies competing. If you don't like the way one behaves, you can, find, you can give your business to another, but then when the market is dominated by few larger players, the rest of us don't have much choice. For example, Chick-fil-A is very open about its Christian ethos, right? We love Chick-fil-A, but if some people don't like it, they just don't have to go there. They can go to Kentucky Fried Chicken or Bojangles or wherever, right? But when a Catholic apostolate gets banned from Twitter because Twitter didn't like something they said, you can't just say, who cares, we'll go to the other texting, sharing, there is none. Is it only Twitter, right? So, so, so you're stuck, right? So I think Professor Martin is right to be worried that concentration of wealth and power is very dangerous to a society. Indeed, it can be terminally dangerous. Dr. John Powelson was a professor of economics for many years at the University of Colorado. He spent several decades trying to understand why some countries were highly successful and prosperous and why so many others weren't. Why is it that over hundreds of years, only Europe, Japan, and Europe's cultural descendants in North America and Australia were able to achieve long-term, i.e. 100 years and more, sustainable development? Earlier in his career, Professor Powelson spent time as a consultant in economic development, and he knew that sustained economic development needed things like liberal trade, sound money, enforcement of contracts, privatization of enterprise, defense of property rights. And the question that he asked was, how come these things arise in some countries and not in others? And how come they work in some countries, but for other countries that try them, they don't seem to, at least not in a sustained way? He looked like at a large number of countries over several centuries since the Middle Ages. In his landmark book, Centuries of Economic Endeavor, he answers these questions. He says the conclu his conclusion is that the main difference 
between prosperous countries and poor ones is balance of power. Where there is a balance of power, the different players keep each other in check, and you have political stability and economic prosperity. Where there's no balance of power, the powerful take everything they can for themselves, because there's no one to stop them, and they leave insufficient resources for development, which means their society either declines or else never becomes prosperous in the first place. If you always take more than you produce, that's just not sustainable. Argentina is a good example, a country with tremendous natural resources that has gone from boom to bust again and again over the last century and more. So entrepreneurial capitalism leads to prosperity, supports the family and civil society. Imperialistic capitalism leads to concentration of wealth and power, destroys the balance of power, and undermines the family and society. So we need to encourage more entrepreneurial capitalism and discourage imperialistic capitalism. How do we do that? Here's the thing. Entrepreneurial capitalism and imperialistic capitalism are not different economic systems. They are, in a sense, the same system, right? Private property ownership with liberal trade, but operated in different ways by different people. Why is this important? It's important because while there are systems or structures that lead good people to bad things, what St. John Paul II calls structures of sin, there are no such things as structures of sanctity. There's no system that can take a bad person and force them to be good. So we cannot structure ourselves out of this problem. As the Catechism of the Catholic Church says, there are no just structures without people who want to be just. The solution then is to promote Catholic social doctrine in the, in the practice of business, which I think is a very good fit with what I've been calling entrepreneurial capitalism. And this is the mission of the Bush, Tim and Steph Bush School of Business at the Catholic University of America. This is what we teach, this is what we do, to prepare our students to live the social doctrine in the business world, to be principled entrepreneurs and virtuous business leaders. This is our auditorium with the former CEO of HP, presidential nominee Carly Fiorina, who's a distinguished professor at our school. Here she's lecturing on leadership. Here is one of our case study rooms. I bet you've never seen a room full of nuns doing an HR case study. So these nuns will be experts in finance. So um, here is our chapel. And I've also bet you've never seen stained glass windows with saints in business suits. So <laughs> that's in our chapel. So what exactly is Catholic social doctrine applied to business? The compendium of the social doctrine of the Catholic Church presents five principles. The United States Conference of Catholic Bishops offers seven themes. Others have offered 10 theories. It can get a little confusing. It's hard to synthesize more than 100 years of papal documents, but I think it is possible. Professor Joe Capizzi and I edited this book called A Catechism for Business, now in its second edition. It has direct quotations from all the major church documents on the social doctrine in answer to questions about finance, marketing, human resources, and so on. Here's me giving a copy of this to Pope Francis. Uh, you've heard about selling ice to Eskimos. Try giving a catechism to the Pope, right? So, <laughs> I, I find it useful to summarize the social doctrine as a set of three apparent, though not real, tensions. The first apparent tension is between solidarity, which is our responsibility to care for others, and subsidiarity, which is the principle that decisions ought to be taken by those closest to the point of impact. There appears to be a tension. Should you be helping other people, which is solidarity, or should you leave them alone to help themselves, which is subsidiarity? And the answer is you can do both together. The entrepreneurial capitalist should always be guided by solidarity, by a desire to serve our customers, our employees, and our investors. They should also recognize that a good way to serve, particularly the employees, is to enable them and support them in doing things for themselves, because that is more in accord with their human dignity. That is the principle of subsidiarity. So you provide training and development, for example, for employees, so that's one way of doing that. The second apparent tension in social doctrine is between private property and what is called the universal destination of goods. The first says that we have a right to private property, while the second says, and this is Catholic teaching, that God created the things of the world for the benefit of all. This seems to be a very big contradiction. Either property is private or it is meant for all. Here's how you bring them together. St. Thomas Aquinas says that there are two aspects to private property. There's the ownership aspect, right, which is the right to buy and sell and dispose of property on the one hand, and the use or the right to use or decide how the property is used on the other. Both of these are part of the right to private property. 
He explains, St. Thomas Aquinas explains that there are three reasons why, as far as ownership is concerned, we should have private property. The three reasons are that people take better care of things that belong to them, first. Second, that human affairs are more orderly if we each have our own things to care for. And three, that there's more, it's more peaceful when things are clearly divided. So it's very wise and thoughtful. But St. Thomas goes on to say, as far as the use of our property is concerned, we should use it as if it were for the common good, to serve others. So private property and the universal destination of goods come together when we own the, pro the, the property, we decide how to use it, and we use it in order to serve others. How do you use your property to serve others for the common good? By using it to support your family and those you care for, of course, first. By giving to charity is another. And another very important way is by investing it. Pope Pius XI wrote that investing your property in businesses so that others have the opportunity to work is an outstanding exemplification of the virtue of munificence, he said. Entrepreneurial capitalists use their capital to serve others, and that's how they fulfill the universal destination of created goods. And the third and final tension, apparent tension, between is between markets and virtue. They appear to be in tension, because in markets you're competing with others, while virtue leads to serve others, in fact, not only do these not contradict each other, but they each need the other. The market economy provides the freedom in which to exercise virtue, where virtuous systems can prosper and lift each other out of poverty. And virtue, trust, hard work, honesty, courage, cultivated in the non-market institutions of the family, the church, and educational institutions, virtue is essential for the existence of the market economy. So what does this all mean? It means that when young people are attracted to socialism, we need to show them that entrepreneurial capitalism, Catholic social doctrine applied to business, is what they are really looking for. So <laughs> when, when they say that capitalism is greedy and selfish, let us explain to them that they are talking about imperialistic capitalism, but we are talking about entrepreneurial capitalism. Let us make the case that entrepreneurial capitalism is better than socialism, not just because it promotes freedom and prosperity, but because it is more just and more caring than socialism. That will blow their minds. Entrepreneurial, <laughs> entrepreneurial capitalism is a just and caring way to run our economic life. It is supportive of human virtue and of human institutions, like the family. It is consistent with our Catholic faith, and upon it, we can rebuild our civilization. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abella. That was incredibly refreshing. It is great to hear. It is great to hear, uh, well, an apologetic, really, for uh, uh, a good entrepreneurial capitalism, a virtuous capitalism, a virtuous capitalism that not only leads to greater productivity, greater creativity, greater market access, and greater freedom, but also leads to greater justice, virtue, and charity, and caring. And that truly is the message that we can bring with our Catholic social teaching combined in with a very rigorous and vigorous entrepreneurial capitalism that can keep our economy going and at the same time keep our democracies free. Uh, Dr. Abella, this is just a great apologetic. I'll take it into my own students and into my own classrooms. Really appreciate it immensely. Thank you.